Hello and welcome to another Starry Storytime with the Ward Beecher Planetarium. My name is Eleni and I'm excited to be reading our story today. Today we'll be reading Annie Jump Cannon, Astronomer by Carol Gerber and illustrated by Christina Wald. On clear nights, they climbed up, up, up the long staircase of their three-story home. Annie, holding a flickering candle, led the way. Following behind was her mother, Mary Elizabeth, carrying charts from her school days. When they reached the attic, they opened the trap door and stepped onto the roof. By candlelight, they matched the charts of the heavens to the stars overhead. In this way, Annie learned the names of constellations visible from her rooftop in Dover, Delaware. Annie's father worried about the candle starting a fire, but he did not forbid stargazing. Instead, Wilson Cannon allowed his daughter to develop her quick mind. Annie Jump Cannon was born on December 11, 1863, during the Civil War. She was given her mother's maiden name as a middle name. Annie was a lively child who liked to play the piano. She grew up secure and happy. Her father's company built ships and the family lived in a 19-room house. When a nearby boys' school began admitting girls, Annie's parents enrolled her. In 1890, she graduated first in her class and gave an uplifting valedictorian speech. She titled it, Golden Grains from Life's Harvest Field. Like her classmates, she was eager to get on with her life. However, she didn't yet know what lay ahead. But her father did. While on a trip, he had toured Wellesley College in Massachusetts. He was impressed that a women's college offered the same courses as male universities. That fall, Annie's parents enrolled her in the only women's college offering physics classes. One of the first teachers Annie met at Wellesley was Sarah Frances Whiting. All students were required to take her physics classes, where they learned about the science of energy and matter. The women conducted lab experiments that helped them discover scientific principles. This type of learning suited Annie. She liked figuring things out for herself. Annie loved Wellesley. Her grades were outstanding. However, during her sophomore year, she had a setback that would have defeated a less determined girl. After being sick with scarlet fever, Annie developed an ear infection that left her partially deaf. Still, she vowed to graduate with her class, and she did. In 1884, Annie earned a degree in physics. Upon graduation, at her mother's urging, she moved home. Because her family was wealthy, Annie did not need to find a job. Instead, she taught herself photography. This skill came in handy in 1892 when she traveled to Europe with a friend to photograph an eclipse of the sun. When Annie returned, the Blair Camera Company printed a booklet of her photographs. Titled In the Footsteps of Columbus, it was sold at the 1893 World's Fair. Annie was excited to see her name on the cover. Afterwards, though, she felt restless. Annie and her mother were extremely close and enjoyed their time together. However, Annie was 30 years old and wanted a more independent life. In December of 1893, Annie's mother died unexpectedly. Annie was grief-stricken, but took comfort from recalling how she and her mother had studied the stars. In 1894, she returned to Wellesley to study astronomy. She worked as Sarah Whiting's teaching assistant to support herself. Annie, who had been so bored at home, was again cheerful and busy. She enjoyed her classes at Wellesley. She also took classes at nearby Radcliffe, the women's college at Harvard. 
There, she used the telescope at Harvard Observatory. This decision set the course for Annie's career. In 1896, the director of the observatory hired Annie. Edward Pickering needed her help with a project, photographing and classifying all the stars in the sky. The widow of an amateur astronomer named Henry Draper paid for the project. Annie soon learned she would not be taking pictures of the stars. Instead, like Pickering's other female assistants, Annie would examine the photographs taken by male astronomers. The women would determine each star's position in the sky and the type of light it emitted. No one had ever before undertaken such a massive project. Compiling the nine volumes of the Henry Draper catalog became Annie's life's work. The astronomers attached a device called a spectrograph to their telescopes. It separated each star's light into different wavelengths. Annie had used a similar device in her physics classes. The images of each star's light, or spectrum, were then imprinted onto photographic glass plates called spectrograms. The assistants who examined the plates were known as computers. Their job was to analy analyze the type of light coming from each star by looking for telltale dark lines. These lines helped them determine what the star was made of and how hot it was. For their work, the women were paid one-fourth of men's wages. Why weren't Pickering's assistants allowed to photograph the stars? Mr. Pickering had three reasons. He felt women should not work at night with men. He believed women were better at detailed tasks, and perhaps most importantly, he could pay women far less than men. These women are capable of doing as much good routine work as astronomers who would receive much larger salaries, he explained. Three or four times as many assistants can thus be employed. The computers used magnifying glasses to examine the spectrographs. They called out facts about each star's light to other women, called recorders. The recorders wrote the facts onto notebooks. Annie had sharp eyes and a good memory. She did not hear sounds that distracted others. She became the fastest computer and could classify three stars a minute. However, she saw a problem with the A to O alphabetical system that was used to classify the star's spectra. Annie noticed that the brightest O stars were the hottest. The A stars were the third hottest. This led her, between 1911 and 1915, to develop a shorter and more accurate system for classifying stars that is still used. Annie ranked stars from the hottest, white and blue in color, to the cooler red ones. She put the hottest stars in the O category. The next hottest were in the B category, and so on. The coolest were classified as M stars. The letters in Annie's hottest to coolest system were O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Annie came up with a sentence that made the system easy to remember. O, B, a fine girl, kiss me. While working, Annie continued her studies. In 1907, at age 44, she earned a master's degree in astronomy. She did not take time off to celebrate. Instead, she continued speeding through spectrograms. Between 1911 and 1915, she classified nearly 250,000 stars. In 1922, Annie was sent to Harvard's observatory in Peru for a special assignment. Finally, she was permitted to use a spectrograph and telescope, as the male astronomers did. When she returned to Massachusetts, she classified and cataloged the thousands of Southern Hemisphere stars she had photographed. Annie became known as the census taker of stars and earned many awards. The one she valued most came in 1925. Oxford University honored her at age 62 with a Doctor of Science degree. She was the first woman to receive it. When she was 75, Harvard finally gave Annie the title Professor of Astronomy. As a child, Annie became fascinated by stars. This fascination lasted a lifetime, ending with her death at age 77. Shortly before she died on April 13, 1941, Annie wrote to her friend, 
At the observatory, I am classifying, classifying. Of course, I love to do it. Annie's love for her work shaped her life and led her to set a world record that still stands. Annie Jump Cannon classified the spectra of more than 400,000 stars. Thank you for joining me for another Starry Storytime. Again, that was Annie Jump Cannon Astronomer. I'll see you next time. Thank you.